uh, we felt that it was probably better to go to alternate weeks uh, in order to maximize uh, the attendance and actually not to tire people out by just uh, bombarding people with uh, MS Teams uh, sessions uh, too frequently. I hope you've all had some uh, respite from COVID and from uh, Teams and Zoom and everything like, uh, like that over uh, the last couple of weeks and certainly we're getting something of an Indian summer and I have to say the last couple of days certainly in Dublin have been uh, very pleasant indeed. The uh, topic this evening is uh, of great importance I think to all general surgeons and indeed all surgeons who are involved in endoscopy because it's going to take us on a journey uh, which began uh, pretty much about the time I qualified when some of the first endoscopes, flexible, the modern endoscopes were coming into use. And I can still remember uh, in Sir Patrick Dunn's hospital, Donald Weir uh, was one of the first gastroenterologists in the country to introduce flexible endoscopy. And uh, of course, all of us came out with black eyes in those days because you had to uh, hold the lens right up to your eye and uh, if you didn't come out looking like you had had one of those um, uh, single ocular lenses uh, at the end of a session, you clearly weren't doing your job. Um, and then the revolution really in technology uh, has been phenomenal over the time. Uh, and uh, the uh, now the ability to look at everything on a screen and then to use uh, the modern um, artificial intelligence to analyze what you're seeing and actually begin to uh, give you information about the pathology you're viewing uh, is extraordinary. But with that has come a need, I think, to um, uh, to audit outcomes and uh, to ensure that uh, the KPIs within a unit are being maintained. And to that end, uh, it's no longer enough to see one do one, uh, teach one, as I think many of us uh, who started endoscopy so many years ago uh, would have found. Uh, and so there is a discipline to doing it. And you're now going to uh, hear during this evening uh, the proposals to introduce competency, competency skills training in gastrointestinal endoscopy uh, and a common pathway for both uh, gastroenterologists and surgeons. Uh, Ken Mealy, our past president, has been uh, very much engaged in this, um, as has Fia Cook, who will be talking to us later. And Tim Ryan, um, I think Tim and I probably soldiered in the same trenches back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s uh, when we learned how to do endoscopy. And I think Tim is going to reflect a little bit on where we've come from uh, before asking Fiekra uh, to tell us where we need to go. So I'm going to hand over to Ken Mealy, who's going to moderate the session and uh, introduce it. Ken, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Eric, yeah, if you'd like to put up the slides there. I'm just going to set the scene and, and I'd like to also welcome uh, Tim Ryan and Faker Cook. Uh, both are champion endoscopists and really have popularized this amongst the surgical community. So I'm delighted that you joined. Us. Yeah, sorry, I have a problem with my internet here. Uh, so if, if I can have the first slide, I'm going to show just two slides to show the state of play in endoscopy currently in Ireland. Um, and the first slide shows what has happened. Uh, if you can Show us the next slide, Erica. Um, the, the, this shows the see uh, endoscopy numbers, uh, and this is hype days uh, up. Uh, uh, Ken, can I suggest you turn off your yes. camera because you're breaking up? So if you turn off your camera and just go on voice. OK, so th this shows that the endoscopy numbers are still dramatically de decreased on pre-COVID numbers. And if we can have the next slide, the consequences of this in terms of surgery, particularly for serious conditions such as cancer, uh, is all likewise diminished. And, and again, uh, this is data up to uh, earlier this year, um, uh, which is in press. 
but shows that uh, cancer operations uh, as a consequence of decreased endoscopies and diagnosis are still significantly decreased on pre-COVID uh, levels. So that's just uh, as an aside, if we can have the next slide now, really to introduce today's topic, and that's really quality assurance in endoscopy. And if you think about it, uh, colonoscopy in particular is one of the few procedures that surgeons and gastroenterologists do that can be fully quality assured. There's practically nothing else that we do that you can quality assure in the same way. And that has huge implications, not only for uh, patient safety and quality of patient care, but also uh, medical legal issues in relation to missed cancers, for instance, uh, comfort and uh, patient dignity, because we measure all of that when we do endoscopies. And I have been aware of legal cases within that domain. I've been aware of legal cases in relation to uh, missed cancers. And then the complications, of course, also uh, perforation, bleeding and other complications. All of these uh, can, to a huge extent, be quality assured by what we do in terms of measuring endoscopy. Can I have the next slide, please? In terms of um, quality assurance, in Ireland we published data with the advent of bowel screen in 2010, 2012. Uh, the first set of KPIs uh, for colonoscopy was released. And next slide, please. Uh, and, and that's been added to with the quality uh, improvement uh, program in endoscopy. Um, and the first report is in 2017. Uh, showing data from 2016. And next slide, please. Uh, we, we have progressed from that. Uh, and if you look at more recent guidelines, next slide, please. Um, if you look at the AGA, for instance, there's a whole suite of quality assurance parameters that we should be measuring when we carry out colonoscopies that relate to patient safety, patient comfort, the quality of the procedure, the number of polyps, the type of polyps, what we do with those polyps. And this is all coming down the line, and this is something that any endoscopist needs to be aware of. And if I can have the next slide. The last edition of the, the National Quality Improvement Program in Endoscopy uh, for 2019, for the first time, uh, listed the hospitals. Individuals aren't listed, but the hospitals are. And there's a whole series of key recommendations. And you can read these for yourself. But these are going to become more and more important as individuals are going to be held account to address each of these recommendations in terms of their own practice. Next slide, please. Uh, as I indicated, there are medical legal implications. And some of us are only far too aware of what happens when the quality of endoscopy goes wrong. Next slide, please. Uh, in the media in Ireland in the last three or four years, uh, there have been two major recalls, uh, one in Lachlanstown Hospital uh, two years ago, and another that had personal uh, implications for myself, because one of the things that has come out of poor quality endoscopy, it's not just the individual practitioner uh, that is held to account, but it's the government structure around the process and provision of endoscopy that is also held to account. And I know that to my own uh, detriment. So um, final slide, please. So that leads us to where we are now. Gone are the days when uh, one could be self-taught in endoscopy. It was an add-on. The registrar went down to the endoscopy room to carry out a few endoscopies while their trainer or the consultant carried on with operating in an operating room. Uh, those days are over, and uh, as a consequence of some of the things I, I've I, I discussed here, um, as a joke, sorry, there's a real gremlin in my, my, uh, my internet connection here. So you can see uh, the complexity training uh, uh, I've listed here. Uh, this is going to be released later on this month, and uh, I would urge all of you uh, to log on to the uh, the introduction because it will give uh, an insight into what will be required, particularly for our, tr our trainees in, in the coming years. So that leads us then to our two speakers tonight. Tim Ryan was probably the first uh, endoscopy champion that surgeons had in this country. And he's trained a generation uh, of surgeons formally in colonoscopy in a way in which certainly I was not trained. So Tim is going to present to us his lifetime experience of what has happened 
uh, in terms of uh, these issues in relation to his own career. And then we're going to be followed by Fierke Cook, who certainly has been instrumental in providing the governance structure and has been instrumental in defining what the standards would be uh, for this new programme. So um, I now invite Tim Ryan, who's going to present uh, on his experience over his lifetime in endoscopy. Tim, you're very welcome, and thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, thanks very much, Ken. Um, I've uh, welcomed the opportunity. The, um, can we have the, the first slide, please? So just to set the scene, I'll give you some sort of timeline, particularly for the younger members of uh, this webinar. I think anyone looking down a black hole needs a light. And we have to give that credit to Thomas Edison back in 1879. There's some dispute about that, but anyway, he's, he was the main man. Then in, I'm only talking about uh, uh, video endoscopy, uh, sorry, um, uh, fiber endoscopy here. So if we forget about all the rigid and semi-rigid and, and uh, gastro cameras and all that that went on, for a couple of hundred years beforehand. In 1954, Hopkins and Cabani uh, developed the concept of light passing down tiny glass fibers that could be bent and uh, take light around corners, etc. And that, that was uh, published in 1954 in Nature. Uh, very quickly, a number of people jumped on this idea and saw the possibilities. And Herchowitz, uh, is credited with having the first gastroscope that was uh, practical, I suppose is the best word, um, in 1958. Uh, Terrell talked about colon uh, colonoscope, but didn't really publish work on colonoscopy, and then over Holt uh, in 1966 started reporting on colonoscopy. Principally at that time it was really left-sided, but it rapidly became full colonoscopy. Then the next big step forward was uh, the CCD, which is a charged couple device, and I have no idea what that is. But basically, it's the important bit of digital cameras, and it allowed light uh, or images to be transferred into uh, digital data, which could then be moved from one place to another. And it was the beginning of the video scope. Now, it was about 15 years before the first video scope came on the market, which is an American company uh, in 1983. And then later on, obviously, um, Olympus joined in. And then the next big and sort of major technical development was the scope guide, which made training so much easier. Um, next slide, please. So this is a list of the associated procedures that go with uh, endoscopy and a sort of timeline. So in the previous uh, slide, you would have noticed that there was a little arrow. That arrow reflects my uh, um, passing out of University College Dublin in 1974. So that's where I came in uh, to the uh, uh, era of uh, endoscopy. Uh, so on to the next slide again. So uh, what I've left out here uh, and shouldn't have left out is the fact that polypectomies were first described about 1973, the same as sphincterotomy by a guy called Wolf. Management of GI hemorrhage was very much talked about in the 1980s, but in my opinion, uh, really uh, at that time what they were doing was they were treating bleeds from the GI tract that would have stopped spontaneously anyway. And it wasn't really until the development of um, the uh, CLIPS that uh, real uh, management of significant GI hemorrhage uh, became possible. And that dates back to about the year 2000. Obviously, PEG tubes, endoscopic ultrasound scan, I know nothing about it. It was just coming in when I started working in the Mater Hospital. Uh, I'm told that now in many of the big centers, uh, an endoscopic ultrasound is almost part of a gastroscopy. Uh, I saw varicea banding as a huge step forward because I hated injecting sclerosins. Uh, I thought it was extremely dangerous and it had a number of, not serious, but a number of complications associated with it. 
expanding made it much, much more controlled and much easier and was a big step forward. And then obviously self-expanding metal stents made the management of strictures much easier. They were first reported in 1990, but again, it took about 10 years for them to, to uh, become uh, easily available. Uh, next slide, please. So just looking back uh, at the history, and I found this bit very interesting. I, I managed to contact a number of people, namely John Lennon, John Crow, uh, and a few others in relationship to the development of endoscopy in the 60s and 70s. So John Lennon probably gave me the most information. He was an intern and then an SHO to Professor Stephen Doyle. Now, in the 60s, John says that there was a gastroscope in almost every theater in the country towards the end of the 60s. He said they were rarely, if ever, used. However, a number of uh, physicians, namely Professor Stephen Doyle, the uh, already mentioned uh, Professor Weir, and I think Professor McCarthy down in Galway, all uh, got scopes that they controlled and started performing uh, endoscopy and started training in the, in, in the process. Uh, John went on to be an SHO in Scotland for about five years, which probably dates from about 69 to 74. And um, he describes everyone being so, I mean, this is in a medical unit, obviously, not a surgical unit, describes everyone as being very excited about the possibilities of gastroscopy. And uh, there, there being large crowds in the uh, endoscopy room when, when scopes were being performed. There was a real um, attitude towards getting uh, trained in the procedure. Uh, John came back and uh, became a consultant in the Mater Hospital, and he basically immediately set up a, uh, a GI unit in the Mater. He was joined uh, not long afterwards by um, John Crow, and before that, uh, Colin Moore, Professor Colin Moore of Helicobacter fame came back uh, as an SHO to the matter and worked with John. Uh, Colin Moore had in fact gone and trained in France immediately after his internship and worked with an eminent uh, gastroenterologist in France and came back with the knowledge associated with doing ERCPs and colonoscopies. And between the two of them, John, with the aid of his SHO, Colin Moore, developed colonoscopy and an ERCP program. The, um, John would admit that the first couple of years of colonoscopy were extremely difficult. He said the scopes were poor, they weren't very flexible, the vision wasn't very good, and the prep was appalling. There were long times when they couldn't get out of the sigmoid colon, and it was all very difficult. But within a matter of a couple of years, they basically had mastered the, uh, the uh, technique. Now, to his credit, John did a, a, a large number of things to uh, improve his technique. He describes yearly visits to St. Mark's uh, and uh, to get training from Chris Williams in colonoscopy and to the Middlesex to see Peter Cotton doing ERCPs. He also attended numerous uh, uh, training programs in Europe, um, and uh, he particularly mentioned a very notable one which was held in Amsterdam. It was a four-day training in, in uh, endoscopy. Uh, so over the 70s, he became uh, extremely good at what he was doing and uh, went on then, probably in the late 70s, I think, to develop his own training program in the Marta Hospital. And he says that it was attended mainly by... In, by uh, SHOs and registers, and a few doctors from uh, the peripheral hospitals. He wasn't all, the, his colleagues in Dublin were not at all pleased that he was uh, teaching people to do uh, endoscopy outside of the pale. Uh, next slide, please. So in contrast, my own endoscopy training. So I qualified in 1974 as an intern in the Lords and went on into the surgical, uh, the SHO rotation in Dublin. Uh, did a year, it did, uh, took off to do a middle grade uh, registrar job in uh, Manchester of three years. 
and finally uh, came back, well, went to America and did my research for two years, uh, mainly in uh, biliary motility and gallstone formation. And at the end of that program, uh, I came back and became a, uh, I got onto the senior registrar rotation, um, which was then and still is a major step. Um, at the end of that program, and that program included working with an, in a number of uh, uh, surgical uh, gas, uh, gastrointestinal units, I basically had little or no gastroscopy experience and had no colonoscopy experience. I mean, my knowledge, I suppose, at the end of my middle grade registrar was that GI symptoms were investigated uh, by barium studies and rigid sigmoidoscopy. I also managed to do some uh, rigid uh, esophagoscopies, which must remain the most uh, stressful and difficult procedure I've ever done in my entire career. And I was very glad to see the back of that. Um, but anyway, I probably am not giving credit to some of my uh, consultants in the senior registrar rotation, and probably some of them did some limited endoscopy, but I don't remember that. And I certainly know that when I took my next step, I moving to uh, the MARTA to do uh, work in the GI unit there, I really didn't have a clue at, as how to do, at how to do a colonoscopy. So next slide. So I then went uh, to, and I suppose it was relatively unique in, in becoming a, a, train, a trainer, basically a research fellow in the MARTA GI unit. Uh, which was run by Professor Crow, Dr. Lennon, and they had Dr. Eileen Clark, who did a lot of the scopes there. Um, the, now, why did I do that? Well, I did that for the first reason, I would say, is I had this idea in my head, although it hadn't actually happened, that uh, GI endoscopy was going to be an important uh, uh, technique in delivering uh, uh, on minimally invasive surgery. Uh, so we were going to carry uh, parts of what are now called stapling devices, etc., up into where they were needed using scopes. Now, it never happened. There was one attempt, I think, which pretty much uh, uh, disappeared in about uh, 12 months. But basically what I thought was going to happen didn't happen. But the other reason was that I knew, and I can't tell you exactly why I knew, but I knew my medical colleagues were very good at endoscopy and I wasn't. So I felt that they had a lot to teach me and a lot to learn and I wanted to be in control of my own uh, practice. In particular, I wanted to be able to do my own investigations. Uh, I was very interested in upper uh, so gastric cancer and colonic and rectal cancer and I thought that was going to be the major part of my, my uh, work. So I wanted to be in control of that, and that was the other and probably the, the real reason and certainly the successful uh, push that made me go and take that particular job. So in the job, I participated daily in uh, lists at both lower, upper and lower GI endoscopy. Um, I got to do a lot of scopes. I got a lot of training. Uh, I did weekly ERCP lists. I never mastered the side viewing scope and, and uh, pretty much never continued with that particular aspect of the thing. At the end of the 18 months I spent in the GI unit, I felt I was competent uh, in gastroscopy and probably felt I was co uh, a competent colonoscopist. In fact, I probably wasn't. But uh, we then move on to the next slide. So I was then appointed in 1989 as a consultant general surgeon in Leonard Kenny. And one of the big things there was number one, they already had an endoscopy unit, which had been started by uh, um, Brian Callahan and also to some extent by his colleague, Jim Golden, the surgeon, my predecessor in Leonard Kenny. And uh, they had actually uh, started at following a training course at John Lennon's uh, 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 unit in, in uh, the MARTA, i.e. the training course that he described. Um, and 
Brian Callan obviously thought it was very important because he got the best sister he had on his medical ward and appointed her as head of the GI endoscopy unit. And uh, so we had a we had a unit, we had scopes, and we had wonderful staff. So uh, I was off to a good start. Um, you can see from the numbers there that between 89 and 2012, I did probably more than 7,000. Those are conservative figures, colonoscopies and 5,000 gastroscopies. Uh, and I'm probably up around the 10,000 mark for both uh, procedures now. I never, as already uh, suggested, I never continued with ERCP. I was lucky enough to have an excellent colleague in Atna Galvin, and there was an arrangement where we could uh, get um, uh, the gastroenterologist Nat McElvin to do our ERCPs. He gave us a fantastic service. I only found out many ye years later that all the patients were private patients to him and he was very well recompensed for his efforts. But nevertheless, the, the, uh, the service he gave us was fantastic. So there was no need. Um, on the other hand, there was a huge waiting list for barium enemas. So there was a real need for uh, particularly lower GI endoscopy. And I started uh, weekly lists that were all day long and did a large number of upper and lower GI scopes. Um, in terms of the unit, about 1994-95, we had been working out of a theater up beside the, the uh, an old disused theater up beside the A&E unit. And we moved from there down to a uh, state-of-the-art endoscopy unit in our day services thing, about 1995. Up until then, we'd been using fiber optic scopes, and about the same time as our move down, we moved on to video scopes. Uh, Sister Keeney, who was the unit manager, loves to tell me that I objected strongly to video scopes when they first came in, and I have to admit that I did, because I felt that the picture wasn't as real uh, to my surgically trained eyes, I, I had seen the inside of the stomach and seen the inside of the colon and the pictures that were being projected on the screen didn't fit to my way of thinking. Anyway, the pictures improved um, and I became a convert. The biggest thing about uh, video scopes was, number one, you didn't have to hold the eyepiece to your eye, but much more importantly, everyone in the endoscopy room participated in the uh, scoop and the nurses became very experienced and they kept reminding me oh did you not see that polyp there did you not see this did you not see that and uh, they were a second third and fourth pair of eyes on the procedure which was very very helpful um, next slide please so going on to talk about uh, training, uh, you know, becoming a trainer in endoscopy. I was appointed or asked to join the RCSI endoscopy course. I can't remember when I would say in the early 2000s, uh, part of the SPR program. And uh, I was also uh, a, a trainer in the uh, endoscopy unit in Letter Kenny. Um, the one thing I forgot, can we go back to the previous slide? The, uh, I did put down there that I was uh, a, invited to be a guest faculty at a colonoscopy training day in Bowman Hospital. Steve Patchett and Frank Murray invited me to come down and be a, the sort of uh, uh, the surgical uh, presence at the course. Now, I was there as a faculty, but it became a huge uh, learning process for me. The uh, immediate thing that I noticed was that I wasn't nearly as good as my medical colleagues. Um, and I got a lot of information in as how to improve. So I was their star pupil, not really a faculty member. And I think it's important that I acknowledge that. Next slide, please. So on to the training courses. So uh, if we start, next slide, please. If we start at uh, the endoscopy course in the RSI, now in, in the course of uh, preparing this uh, webinar, I actually found an old notebook where I had jotted down my initial um, thoughts on um, uh, a training uh, endoscopy course. And they basically were, as you see on the slide, 
Um, I wanted to uh, make sure that people understood that it wasn't just a technique, that it was a journey, that there were many parts of the journey, and I list them out there. Obviously, patient selection is terribly important uh, and fraught with difficulty because, uh, as, I, as I always point out to people, uh, symptoms, basically selecting patients on the basis of symptoms is extremely dangerous. Symptoms are very late uh, in the development of both upper and lower GI cancers. So if we just do patients who've got symptoms, we're going to be late a lot of the time. Uh, so deciding not to do a scope is actually very quickly because you've got probably a 10% incidence of polyps in an unselected group of people, asymptomatic people. So it's very quickly, if you, you decide not to do scoops, you're actually going to miss significant pathologies and you're going to end up in trouble. So I start by saying patient selection, it's important. Uh, however, it's also uh, filled with potholes and, and potential dangers. Consent, obviously, I stress the fact that it should start in the outpatients. There must be written documentation to, to given to the patient that they can read at their leisure. And then the final consent is done prior to their procedure. Bowel prep is too difficult to go into, uh, but basically it determines um, the uh, accuracy, the efficacy, uh, the uh, comfort of uh, colonoscopy. So it's vitally important. And we now at last have someone who is taking responsibility of talking to the patients in relationship to bowel prep, uh, and it has made a significant difference, um, but it's still a problem. We're tending to move towards less severe prep preparations uh, for patient comfort reasons, and it is actually resulting in poorer prep again. Uh, sedation, it's so important, uh, uh, part of the safety aspect. So sedation monitoring, the responsibility of the endoscopist, the overall responsibility of the endoscopist is stressed in relationship to safety and the giving of sedation. Uh, the process itself, the technique, we use, um, we use um, simulators. Uh, we start with by giving lectures on the various topics I've mentioned. We use videos which are very, there's some very good videos, one of them in particular by a uh, by Olympus, uh, which shows how to uh, all the, the sort of maneuvers that you can do with a, with a colonoscope and uh, looping and unlooping and all the various uh, techniques that there are. So combination of lectures, videos, and then the thing that the uh, trainees only want to do, they really, I think, I get the distinct impression, they simply want to get onto the simulators and to hell with all the rest of the stuff. Uh, uh, we use simulators. Uh, next slide, please. So I just put this up to uh, tell people that on the left you have a endoscopy simulator as used in, in the College of Surgeons in our uh, endoscopy course. And on the right you have a rather dilapidated and old uh, net that I practice my golf in. And the point I make and the reason I put this up is simply to say that I am a very uh, good golfer in my golf net, but absolutely useless when I get onto the golf course. And the reverse is true in relationship to simulation. I'm not too good on the simulators in the College of Surgeons, but I'm a much better clinical endoscopist. So simulators are very good. We learn the basic motor functions that are important in any motor technique and, and both Golf and endoscopy are very much, uh, it's very much learning motor skills. Um, simulators give you the basics, they shorten your training period, but they are no substitute for doing the actual uh, procedure. Uh, next slide, please. So my training at Letterkenny University Hospital, I've, I've been interested in training endoscopy from the very beginning. Uh, number one, because I spent so much time doing it myself or learning to do it myself. But uh, I, ha I had a real interest in, in the topic. Um, and I list out some of the important um, uh, 
uh, paths of, of what I think is important when training. So I trained, I suppose, somewhere between 10 and 20 trainees. Uh, I've more recently been involved in the training of three uh, endoscopy nurse specialists um, who have uh, successfully completed their course and are now in practice. Um, so what do I do? Well, I think the most important thing is to remember that patient safety and comfort is paramount. And also that you've actually got to get on and do a list. And my lists tended to be quite long um, and uh, becoming increasingly longer as various new uh, processes came into the mix uh, in terms of uh, writing up things beforehand, etc., etc., etc. Uh, all part of safety, and I shouldn't complain too much, but the lists got more and more difficult, as they have in every part of, of surgical practice. Um, so I think the first and most important thing, having created a nice, uh, comfortable environment, a safe environment, an environment in which the trainee is actually encouraged to ask questions, the trainee is not using using only the endoscope, is taught about the various movements. Um, and I go back to Larry Way, who was probably one of the best endoscopists uh, that America produced. And he always said there were six options. You could turn right, left, up, down, or in and out. And it was simply a matter of making the appropriate move. Uh, and this is still very true. You have got the options, you choose the correct option, and you choose the correct op option by looking at the screen and seeing what's in front of you. So there's no set moves in endoscopy other than going from D1 to D2, which everyone knows you do in a particular way. But other than that, is there a way about, of getting out of the sigmoid colon? The answer is no. Can I tell you how to get around the splenic flexion? The answer is no. You look at the screen and you do what the screen is telling you and you choose from your six options. And that's basically the basis of endoscopy. Um, to give them sort of confidence, I basically start them withdrawing the scope and asking them when they're withdrawing it to do a particular thing like look, look right, look left, up, down or whatever, or focus on a particular point. Um, and I did this for both gastro gastroscopies and colonoscopies, obviously done under supervision, then moved on to teaching intubation, which is probably the most important and difficult part of upper GI endoscopy. Uh, and certainly the bit that the patient remembers most of all. Uh, moving on to doing easy segments of the colon. So when you got into an easy segment, you asked the trainee to get involved and, and uh, move onwards until he, until he was having difficulty. And then you stepped in and helped. Uh, on again to supervising flexible sigmoidoscopy, supervised colonoscopy. And the important thing that I would say in relationship to trainee uh, uh, trainee training, probably true in every aspect of surgery, but it's get them involved in every single case. So every single uh, patient that I had in my endoscopy room, the trainee was involved, either me explaining a particular technique during the case or getting them to do bits of it and finally getting them to do all of it. I felt it was important to set time limits, uh, basically to make sure that you still got your work done and um, uh, I finally, and I still think this is important, although some people probably would frown on it, I feel that people doing the, so the trainee working in a parallel theatre is very important. The reason I believe this is that I know myself, I was always better when I didn't have someone standing over my shoulder. And I learned to ask the better questions when I was stuck on my own. So. Obviously, very, very important that before you move to this level, that the trainee understands the dangers and is shows his uh, willingness to ask for help before he gets into significant problems. Next slide, please. Now, I've headed this opinions rather than conclusions because there is no science here. This is my sort of uh, beliefs, I suppose they'd be best ca called uh, after 30 odd years doing a particular uh, process. Um, I put this in and I put it in at risk of upsetting our moderator because I know he's done Trojan work in relationship to 
uh, ordered uh, in, in surgery. The reason I put it in is because I always, when I get asked to sort of talk about anything like this, which isn't too often, I remember back to a conversation between uh, my old consultants, uh, they were not all that old, not much older than me, uh, when I was a SHO registrar, um, Frank, Frank Keen and Arthur Tanner, talking probably around 1976 about surgical audit, how important it was becoming, how it was going to change the way we did, how it was going to make these huge advances in the process. Uh, and I must say, I have been disappointed uh, at this very, very slow movement of all professions, and particularly I mentioned the surgical profession because it's the one I know a little bit more about. Now, I believe things have actually moved slowly and, and, and we're, get, we're slowly getting there. But I mention it also because I do believe the, um, the um, process of endoscopy has shown us how we can introduce audit and how it can make a huge difference. So the other thing to mention, and, and Ken touched on it, that scandals have driven progress. So I was immensely frustrated for the first 10 years in Letterkenny because every week I was going up to the management, I was writing letters telling them about the waiting list for colonoscopy, a test to look for, for uh, colonic cancers and how the lists were nine months old, 12 months old. People were waiting well over six months to get what was considered an urgent pro procedure done. And I outlined to them how this was going to lead to all sorts of problems. In particular, I could foresee mass litigation coming down the road. But as we all know, uh, there was a big sort of uh, uh, scandal is probably the wrong word, but basically the Susie Long incident uh, that came out of uh, Kilkenny, uh, which in, in, one has to say had one of the best endoscopy units in the country at the time. Uh, but she was waiting six months and was then diagnosed as having colon cancer. And it became a big public issue. And it wasn't long after that that the HSE uh, introduced the concept that people should have a colonoscopy within six weeks of being referred with uh, significant symptoms. And that was a huge step forward because it meant that at last they were paying attention and at last uh, some money was being pushed into the into the process. I think that was around 19, uh, 2002 when that happened. Now, obviously, bowel cancer screening has resulted in excellent order tools, um, which have been applied to endoscopy. And it's like any screening process. The end result of any screening process is that symptomatic disease gets much better treated. And I think this is the case in uh, since we've uh, uh, introduce the bowel screening uh, process. And I also am a great supporter of the bowel screening process because, as I outlined earlier, symptomatic, uh, you know, if we, if we allow symptoms to govern our endoscopies, we are going to be late in a large number of cases. Um, there. There. Onwards. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Uh, Teaching endoscopy, nice. so Nash. this is still my opinions. Uh, hello? Hello? Uh, hello? Nash? Nash? Hello? Can everyone else hello. just mute their, mute their mics, please, while Tim finishes off here? OK. Can you hear me? You can? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. OK. The, um, so the last of them basically is in relationship to training. Um, I think it's important to say that teaching endoscopy is basically a motor skill uh, and you go through the various stages. Uh, it's been well set out how you treat motor skill, how you teach motor skills. Um, I suppose the best way of describing it is in the four steps. You start uh, uh, as, uh, off as unconsciously incompetent. You then learn why you're incompetent and you become consciously incompetent. You then learn how to become competent and you become uh, competently competent. And then finally, without even thinking, you can do the process, you become unconsciously competent. So those are the various stages 
that occur in training a motor skill. It doesn't matter what motor skill it is. Um, I think the current training program is uh, very, very good. And I particularly would say this because I, I never get to follow up on my uh, junior hospital doctors tra trainees, but a, a number of them have gone on to uh, have very distinguished uh, careers, including, of course, my co-presenter today, Fiacra. Um, but uh, I did take participate in the training of three nurse endoscopists, basically under the direction of Chris Steele. And I suppose I never mentioned Chris along the way, but Chris was a big part in helping me develop my own endoscopy skills uh, since he came to Letter Kenny. Um, uh, because he is a master endoscopist. Um, so, in the training of the three nurse, uh, uh, three nurse endoscopists, um, I went through the process, but was just an assistant, I suppose, with them. But I saw the process in its complete, in its complete overall view. So the the pre endoscopy training they had to undergo, then the teaching of the of the technical skills itself. And finally, the uh, the um, the assessment and then the certification. And the thing that I learned out of that, and I think it's important. Well, number one, we gave up on pure numbers. So some years ago, it was considered that if you did two hundred colonoscopes, you were basically ready to go. Uh, and some people certainly were. But the fact of the matter is, people's ability to learn. Uh, any motor skill is very variable and some people required less, some pe people required more. So they have now fixed on a number of 200 as being the minimum number that you do before you're... Tim, uh, I, Tim I'm going to have to cut you off if you don't mind. We're, we're right. really running short on time. So Sorry, I, I like didn't realise I'd overstepped my time. Um, yeah, would you like to just finish off? Is, the one thing I would, the last thing I would stress is certification should be by independent assessors, not the trainers, because I think that's important to uh, get rid of any bias that may be involved. And that is the end, other than my last slide, which is I just put it up for people to remember because I've talked all about technique. And my boss, Ken Bloor, told me this many years ago when he realized I was only interested in te technique. And uh, it's something that lives with me to this day. Thank you. Tim, and my thank apologies you very much. for overrunning time. Not at all. I'm sorry for cutting you short, um, but we are a bit stuck for time. And we'll come back at the end of uh, uh, Fikra's talk uh, because I have some questions I'd love to ask you. So uh, I'll hand you over to Fikra now. Thanks again, Tim. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. And are you sharing your slides as yet? I'm just working up to that now and let me know if. Yeah. Yeah, we have your slides. Great. Great stuff. OK, now, so thank you, Professor O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Mealy. Um, an enormous uh, thank you and hello again to Mr. Ryan, whom I, I hold in the spectacularly highest of regard, having started my, my career as a, a, a surgeon with him in Letterkenny in my first year as an SHO. And uh, to say that he he has left a lasting imprint on me would be a, a huge understatement. Um, in, in fact, if you can see our picture here, uh, Tim has aged better than me, I suspect. Um, but that's myself, uh, Amir Siddiqui, Mr. Ryan's registrar back in 1999. And Tim, all of us intensely focused on uh, whatever colonoscopy uh, procedure that, that, uh, that Tim was in, engaged in at the time. Uh, and he was, he was and remains a pioneer, somebody who has seen something for what it is uh, and was way ahead of his time in appreciating the, the, the subtleties and the complexities of endoscopy. So I suppose if we're talking about the evolution of the process, uh, I'm not going to stress the, the technical or the specifics, if you like, of, of the actual competency process because that's going to get published as has been mentioned on the 30th of September and it's going to be a, a hugely important uh, day in the joint college's uh, life. But but what I would do is in terms of the, the journey that we have taken to get there and the importance uh, and the, 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 the groundswell of of um, of the, the importance of, of endoscopy and in particular colonoscopy as a skill, 
I think for me starts with the the concept and the adoption of uh, a, a bowel cancer screening program. And this ginormous 380 page tome was released as the health technology assessment from uh, the the uh, HICWA people back as the processes and the foundations were being put in place for bowel screen. Um, and, and in parallel with all of what was being conceived from the screening program perspective, then came the, the National GI Endoscopy Quality Improvement Program. Um, and, and as you say, the, the, the HICWA HGA for bowel screening was published in 2009, and it's no surprise that the, the Quality Improvement Program was also uh, launched in 2009 as, as a kind of a, a brainchild of the conjoint board of both the College of Surgeons and College of Physicians. And they, in fact, published their first guidelines uh, on a national quality assurance program for GI endoscopy in October of 2011. Um, the uh, national QA programs over time morphed from quality assurance to quality improvement. Uh, and, and very, very importantly, uh, the adoption of the national quality assurance back then intelligence system, it's now the national quality assurance and improvement system was adapted in order that quality assurance reporting was embedded into the, the, the program using NICWAS data. I suppose this all was utterly dependent upon electronic reporting uh, and consistent uh, reporting of endoscopy procedures in electronic format rather than what was previously handwritten. Um, and that process began uh, in 2012 being rolled out countrywide again in advance of the start of the bowel screen program, which uh, as Ken described, took, uh, took off in 2012, 2013. And it was only with robust um, mandatory key performance metrics being captured in an electronic reporting system that in fact, we could even, we could even imagine getting to a stage whereby we could, we could regularly and robustly and consistently record outcome data or output data. So within within uh, our system in, in Waterford, Endorad, which is our electronic reporting system, went live in, in December 2013. Uh, I know Wexford being a screening centre from the very outset went live sometime earlier that year. Uh, and I suppose my own involvement with the process began on at, at the retirement of both uh, Professor Highland uh, and Mr. Dignan from the uh, steering committee and the working group of the National uh, GI Endoscopy Programme. Uh, and I started on that um, journey in March 2014. So what was the, the, the vision for a, a QI programme? It was to improve patient care by minimising diagnostic errors in gastrointestinal endoscopy and to develop a standardised national system for endoscopy. It was to enable individual endoscopists and in fact units to uh, use the data that was measured and captured in order for them to assess their performance and to benchmark what they were doing against recognized and published national standards and national targets. And furthermore, as the program has developed, it was in order to identify good practice and areas of improvement, and then to, to collaborate and share best practice, practice improvement and quality improvement um, in an overall atmosphere of improved communication. This is a very, very, a, a process that, that I think it has had very, some very key individuals involved along the way and people who deserve enormous credit and mention. Uh, I know Tim referenced Pro Professor Steve Patchett um, when he went to Beaumont as, as faculty on a course from which he came home having learned probably significantly more than most participants. Uh, and that would be my experience of, of Steve. He's been an absolute champion of the quality agenda in GI endoscopy uh, and has been the chairperson of the GI program from 2009 until 2000, the end of 2018, um, where Jan Layden from The Matter ha has taken over as the, the, um, the, the lead. Uh, and the other, uh, I suppose, component to this process is that, that the, the quality improvement programs, of which there are three in radiology, hist histopathology and uh, GI endoscopy, are run and managed through the Royal College of Physicians and have been managed, in my experience, since joining the programme in 2014 by some of the brilliant, brightest people uh, who, who have tied people together, who have continued to drive the enthusiasm that's required behind all this. 
Georgina Farr was the lady that was involved whenever I was co-opted onto the, the program. Uh, and we've had a, a series of, of stellar, bright young people involved uh, through Mairead Guinan, Sarah Trelevan, and currently Conor Canavan, who, who manages the program. I won't spend any time uh, on the, the outputs from the QI program, but suffice to say that they, they, they produce a, an, an annual report uh, a national quality improvement or quality assurance data set for all endoscopies performed countrywide and they continue to produce updated versions of their guidelines so if their first edition were published in October 2011 then at the uh, at the webinar uh, from from last December the sixth version of the guidelines uh, were published and they continue to to remain relevant and to change according to practice uh, and the challenges of the system in parallel the HSE set up the Acute Operations Endoscopy Program in 2016. Uh, and this is a hugely important parallel component to the journey that has brought us to the, the imminent publication uh, of, a, of a joint, a conjoint competency model for training. Uh, and the, the uh, Acute Operations Endoscopy Program was set about to strengthen clinical governance across all hospital groups, uh, and then to increase capacity for endoscopy to meet current and indeed future needs very importantly to deliver and to develop additional training courses in endoscopy and then to support the improvements around validation and scheduling which as Mr Ryan has mentioned is a massive component uh, of, of managing the demand and managing the resource for GI endoscopy. Uh, there's a, a working um, group involved in the support of the rollout and the development of, of, of referral and in, indeed electronic referral pathways uh, and of course, um, the, the joint advisory group, the, the, the oversight, the overarching uh, quality assurance machine from, from the UK, uh, namely JAG accreditation, is, is something that all endoscopy units are, are striving towards. Um, and then very much the acute uh, operations endoscopy program is, is there to support units both to attain and maintain JAG accreditation. And, and again, the bowel cancer screening program and bowel screen underpins so much of what has happened in the quality improvement, improvement and the quality assurance agenda in and around GI endoscopy. So the first uh, clinical lead of the acute operations endoscopy program um, from its inception back in 2016 was, was, was Chris Steele, who as, as um, Tim has said, is, is, a, is a stellar uh, shining light uh, in, in the, the overall quality agenda uh, story around uh, GI endoscopy. Uh, and Chris remained in that role from 2016 until um, sometime in 2018. Um, Glenn Doherty was there in an interim capacity before the appointment of Jan Layden at the end of last year. Uh, and Jan, who's a consultant gastroenterologist in the, in the, in the matter, continues to, to drive this process with, with um, aplomb and professionalism and dedication. We'll get on shortly to the, the, the move towards training and accreditation, but, but Glenn Doherty in his phenomenal role as a, a leader in, in, in education and training, uh, was appointed as the first national training lead uh, of the GI Acute Operations Endoscopy Program. Uh, and, and he has worked tirelessly and in a very short space of time has put in place a, a suite, a package of uh, interventions and opportunities um, that has led to the, the imminent publication of the competency model uh, and a whole raft of, of um, education and upskilling courses that are going to support both trainees and consultants in established practice. And I think it's very, very important to, to credit the, the, again, the incredible people behind the scenes. Um, Grace O'Sullivan, uh, who's the program manager for the uh, acute endoscopy, the, the HSE endoscopy program is, is the most outstanding person uh, and, and works in, in parallel with all of the people on, on the, 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 the program and is just a, a powerhouse of enthusiasm and energy. And Dorothy Murray now as the accreditation and training officer is somebody whom we will be seeing and hearing more about and from as the curator of all of the programs uh, and the courses that are coming on stream. So the strategy that has published um, with a time frame of 2019 to 2022 has really has gathered massive momentum uh, and again is is in in huge credit to glenn doherty who has worked tirelessly in his role as national training lead to have made so much ground in such a short space of time so his training committee was set up pretty quickly 
comprising members of, of both the RCPI and RCSI, it was in order to undertake a, a detailed baseline survey of training um, within gastroenterology and higher surgical trainees and to establish a network to support training needs and to provide a common approach in order to facilitate the gap in service that was there from the, 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 the training equipment and structures that existed in terms of where the, the system wanted to go. Uh, I suppose importantly and ongoingly is uh, the requirement of developing a mechanism to identify and analyze trainee specific data within NICWIS. This is something that hasn't and isn't currently available, but is being worked on such that while the trainee can, can, can pick out his or her own individual data, and I'll show you some stuff from Waterford as an example of volume, um, the subtleties of endoscopist one, endoscopist two, and the assistance that may have been required in any particular procedures uh, for that particular trainee um, is something that's being worked on at, a, at an IT level. So the program goals were really very clear uh, to uh, improve structured training and have a quality education around an infrastructure and ultimately then a sign off and a certification process that was there across both surgical and medical gastroenterology training. Um, and with all of the, the stakeholders in terms of the colleges, the Irish Society of Gastroenterology and of course the HSE. So the competency model for skills training in GI endoscopy is being launched uh, on the 30th of September. And, and if you were to have a, a one liner or a single slide to give you a, a, a flow of, of what it entails, it's based around identifying specialty trainees in GI endoscopy as either medics or surgeons early on with regards to introductory courses, simulators, and an observation of procedures in order to have a baseline. It's fascinating that 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 a lot of what Tim has described in his own exp experience and his own involvement in training is really very much replicated in what is just a more structured and and formatted basis. So DOPS DOPS is the big buzzword in in skills acquisition, and it's 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 the shorthand. It's the acronym for a direct observation of procedural skill. And it takes place in a very supervised environment during the initial phase of training where trainees are uh, exposed to procedures and begin their technical exposure to, to, to training with very close one-on-one -on -one supervision with a consultant trainer. As they, they move through the, 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 the first levels, they move from assisted procedures to performing supervised procedures leading to provisional certification. And again, Numbers here is something that people have, have we, the, 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 the program has, has steered clear of being prescriptive about numbers because as Tim refer, re, refers to, somebody can pick up a technical skill with far fewer numbers of procedures than others. And so it's about, it's about maintaining and documenting the, the, the key elements of, of the process rather than the volumes involved. Beyond provisional certification, an endoscopist moves forward to being an independent albeit nominally supervised practitioner. And this is, 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 is borne out in the concept of the sort of the parallel endoscopy procedure room that Tim mentioned, whereby a consultant uh, is in one room with possibly a more junior trainee, and then a more senior provisionally certified endoscopist is practicing in, in a parallel room, but with supervision. And as numbers and as complexity of case load and case mix increases and key performance indicators and metrics are met, then that trainee moves towards a, a process of, of final certification, which is done, as Tim quite rightly says, via an independent and, uh, and I won't say anonymous, but certainly a, a non-specifically uh, trainer-related process. Um, if, if you look at the, the, the faculty, the, this, this course was conceived by, by the two Gloucestershire gastroenterologists, John Anderson and Roland Valori, who, who remain two of the most inspiring people I've ever come across. And the guys that signed up to subject themselves to this, this uh, training course were, were, were luminaries in gastroenterology, like Frank Murray and Dermot O'Toole uh, and Jan Layden. So Jan was a, a, probably a junior consultant, not dissimilar to me in terms of, of his, his, uh, um, his age, but, but clearly has gone on to very, very great things. Frank Murray was the soon to be incoming president of the Royal College of uh, Physicians. Uh, and of course, Dermot O'Toole is probably one of the brightest guys I've ever worked with. Um, and Afta Rachman then was a, a St. Luke's Kilkenny uh, and a, a very close colleague of Gary Courtney's, who was mentioned previously. 
And then the other surgeon that was on the course that I sat was Pavan Rajpal. Having done that course, myself, Chris Steele and Glenn Doherty were sort of identified as interested people that would go on to form an Irish faculty. Um, and that was an interesting and very, very enjoyable journey and one that's that's been somewhat hampered over the past two years for obvious reasons, but that is being rebooted. And Glenn, uh, Chris and I r run the Irish Train the Colonoscopy Trainer course at the moment. And this is one of our most, more recent uh, courses that we ran in St. Vincent's, where you can see as delegates, we've Adrian Ireland, Anne Brannigan, uh, Brendan Harding and Miles Joyce uh, as our as our candidates, which actually was intriguing and very, very uh, nice to see that, in fact, all four delegates on that particular day were surgeons. Um, the, the, the further evolution of this process was was the, the development of the Colonoscopy Excellence for Consultants course, which is something that Glenn Doherty pursued with, with real vigour. He went over to Canada and met the guys that, that again conceived this course, two, two medical gastroenterologists, Don McIntosh and Eric Greenwald. And he brought those guys over to Ireland to actually run a faculty course and to kind of develop a faculty uh, of people as identified by the, the National um, uh, Endoscopy Training Faculty. Uh, and so the people that sat that course with me uh, were, were Paul McCormick, Danny Cherian, uh, Karen Hartry, and, and, and again, Glenn. Uh, and and this, this was one of those eureka moment days that, uh, that I, I've, I've actually radically changed my practice since. So that course took place in September, end of September 2019. Um, and and no more than what Tim said about his days in Beaumont with with Steve Patchett, uh, I was there nominally as faculty, but I most certainly learned far more than I ever had from any place else prior to this, and came home from that and radically changed how I perform colonoscopy. Very quickly, and again, Ken, cut me off if I'm if I'm over overrunning, but but well, if you look five at, minutes, so uh, that'd be lovely. So if if you look at my cumulative. Uh, Tim referred to kind of his cumulative volume of procedures over the years. There's, 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 there's no way that he's done a fraction less than twice the 10,000 colonoscopies that he reports because as a, as a practitioner, as far back as when I worked with him, his, his volume, but his attention to detail in that volume was absolutely astronomical. So I'm reporting data from, from the time that, that, that uh, Endorad and electronic reporting was introduced in Waterford. So the 1st of January, 2014. And if you look at my data from, from the 1st of January 2014 until the week that I went to the Colonoscopy Excellence for Consultants course in September of 2019, I performed a total of 2,378 colonoscopies. Now, in the time since that, having changed exactly what I do and how I do it, uh, the numbers are dr dramatically smaller. And again, it's, it's been a, a particularly difficult time for anybody in a procedural based business. It's been a particularly difficult time for all of us. But if you look at the 334 colonoscopies that I've performed since adopting what I've learned or what I learned on that particular course, every single one, every single one of the key performance metrics that we measure have Im improved and increased. And if you look at the bottom, the bottom stat, I I've gone to, to using no midazolam for any colonoscopy. Um, at all, uh, and and reducing my intravenous uh, pain relief, my intra intravenous fentanyl, my median intra intravenous fentanyl doses from from 100 to 75 micrograms, and and comfort, bowel prep, polyp detection, polyp recovery, cecal intubation, everything, everything has consistently improved. It was the most staggering, uh, eye-opening experience, and if you like, part and parcel of the ongoing. Uh, national training lead and national training um, focus is, is not just around trainees, but around maintenance of professional competence and, and improvement and upskilling uh, and remedial uh, training for, 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 for consultants in established practice. This was our first course where we all reconvened uh, again in Beaumont. Th these are hugely enjoyable, hugely challenging, but hugely enjoyable days out. And again, maybe just to look I'm very conscious that we've 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 stressed over the course of the, this after this evening's webinar that that volume is not the issue, and it's more about competence. But if you look over the years, this is this is a, an interesting slide that I spent a bit of time picking data out of of Nicholas uh, last night in preparation of today's talk, and we look at a raft of the bright young things that have come through the Department of General Surgery and more laterally the Department of Colorectal Surgery in Waterford. 
um, we, we've, we've, we've people spending, so the, uh, the, the, the top numbers in terms of, of proceduralists are trainees that would have spent more than a year with us. Uh, and some of the slightly smaller numbers uh, in terms of colonoscopies would have been uh, SPRs that came through the GI department for six months of, of their 12 months here as an SPR. But you're looking at, at staggering numbers, if you like, of, of procedures performed if you look at the the cecal intubation, the polyp detection, and the comfort scores, as just a, a snapshot of 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 uh, adherence to, to 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 key performance metrics, you're looking at, at at people doing large volumes of procedures as supervised trainees with staggering numbers of uh, with staggering numbers and staggering quality. So, putting a structure, putting a formal DOPS and certification and cer sign off process on this training model is as, as as Tim has said, is going to be something that's going to be very, very powerful. So I, I'm going to leave you with two uh, comments and observations. Uh, and again, perhaps no more than Tim's sign offs. These aren't based uh, on science, but but they're, they're very, very real in terms of what they mean. Um, as an endoscopy trainer, you, you certainly can't train anybody to be a better proceduralist than in fact you are yourself. And so that mandates and behoves us as train trainers to, to be as good as we possibly can be such that we can we can actually pass that skill on to our trainees. Uh, and I suppose if 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 to finish on a kind of a, a training note, you certainly you can't train somebody if you're not in the room. So this is this is a, a, a reminder that if we're involved and passionate and committed to training people in, in any skills acquisition process, but let's, let's for the sake of tonight's webinar, focus on GI endoscopy, you certainly have to be in with them and have to be part and parcel of the process in order to be a good trainer. Uh, as, a, as a reminder of just upcoming dates, we are now getting back in business uh, after 18 months of, of no real hands-on um, training days and, and so, Following the launch of the, vir uh, of the virtual launch of the competency model in September, we've got the first of our basic endoscopy skills courses on the 30th of September. The first colonoscopy excellence for consultants course is taking place on the 12th of October. And we've trained the colonoscopy trainer course running in mid-November. Now, I know these courses are all well booked out, um, but it's nice just to sort of flag them up as being, being dates in the diary and to give you Dorothy Murray's email address. And I would encourage people to watch the, the um, the notifications and the announcements on the websites and to look look out for and perhaps email your expression of interest to, Dor to Dorothy about upcoming courses of which there will be many. And perhaps just uh, on a local and final point, I might just mention the upcoming Waterford October Surgical Meeting on Saturday the 9th of October, uh, which is on the theme of robotics and innovation in surgery. And just to put in a rider that there's an announcement on an email from the college just that identifies the date correctly on the 9th of October, but mentions that it's a Monday, just to clarify and to, to, to reiterate that it's Saturday, the 9th of October, and uh, it's a virtual meeting, so it can be it can be registered uh, for on www.wsom.ie. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, good. Th thanks very much, and I'm, I'm sorry for rushing both of you. Uh, we're well over time. Just, just briefly, um, there's a couple of comments in the chat uh, function regarding simulators, and I think Tim addressed that. The, there are mechanical simulators in the college, and I think we all agree they're uh, fairly effective for, for basic uh, endoscopy skills. We don't have biological simulators. Um, uh, Zishan, I'm not aware that there's any national policy for for GI bleeders, I think it's a hospital by ho hospital policy, and I do know it's it's an issue for many um, uh, hospitals. And the last comment, I think, um, which I think is probably the most pertinent for, for this audience, and that is uh, how will the college make sure that all of the higher surgical trainees would get certified uh, by CCT? Well, I, I think uh, FICRA has addressed that to a considerable extent, that with the new curriculum, uh, competency like any other skill uh, will need to be signed off by your, tra by your trainers. And uh, to do that and be successful with that, uh, I would encourage all the trainees to embark on as many of the courses that, that Faker has shown there uh, near the end of his presentation. Um, but there are champion endoscopists around the country, and I think they are going to be in great demand by our trainees, particularly in general, 
GI and upper GI surgery. Uh, so to spend time with them to learn skills in endoscopy is equally important as it is for any other operative skills. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I thank again uh, all our, our two speakers and all the, of, of you who have listened in this evening. And I'm going to hand back to the president for some closing remarks. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Ken. Thank you to Tim and Fiekra. Uh Very interesting and uh, no doubt uh, it is uh, uh, really uh, an important advance in uh, establishing the competency uh, of our trainees in endoscopy uh, to have all of these courses available. Uh, we, we try to have um, uh, the Wednesday evening webinar wrapped up by 11, uh, by about uh, 7.15, so we're just on time, so thank you for that. Uh, just a word of, of uh, uh, some caution, we have to be careful about putting up any individual uh, trainee uh, outcome data. Um, so uh, fortunately it was all uh, very positive, but that just is something we need to be careful with. Uh, the next um, webinar will be uh, in two weeks time. Uh, David Quinlan uh, will be chairing a, a session on the advances of prostate surgical oncology, uh, which I think uh, will be um, uh, very important because there's uh, a lot happening in that space. Uh, and uh, I think it's of interest uh, to many of us. So with that, can I thank our speakers and um, I hope all have enjoyed uh, the sessions. I'm sure Tim or Fiekra would deal with any questions you have separately by email uh, if you uh, want to get in contact with them and particularly if you wanted any details about the training courses. So good evening to all and thank you again. Thank you, Roland. Good night, everybody.